Okay, here's a joke. What's the last thing a drummer says in a band? Hey guys, why don't we try one of my songs? If there's any rock band in history you can fairly claim to be called Timeless, it's Creedence Clearwater Revival. Their songs really do sound like they've always existed. In fact, that's what made them so popular. Even during the upheaval and chaos of the 60s, Creedence was the band for everybody, even if you were a hippie or a redneck. And because of their timelessness and down-to-earth image, it's hard to think of them as any kind of pop idols, but they were extremely popular. When the Beatles broke up in 1970, that left Creedence as probably the biggest band in the world. And their music was so good. There are only a handful of bands with as many classic tracks as CCR. And the amazing thing is that they did it in just two and a half years. Just two and a half. Even a lot of the greats were around for like 15 before they accomplished that much. But the six albums Creedence made between 1968 and 1970 were all smash successes and produced some of the greatest songs in rock history. But we're not here today to talk about those six albums. We're going to talk about the seventh. In 1970, Creedence may have been the biggest band in the world now that the Beatles were gone, but Creedence were secretly in the same position as the Beatles, completely dysfunctional and on the verge of total collapse. But they kept soldiering on, they kept on chuglin, and how'd they keep going? Well, imagine it like this. What if the Beatles had not broken up, but instead had chosen to record one more album? And they decided that the only way they could keep the band together and make it happen is if they made Ringo do all the work. And Ringo doesn't get a choice. That's pretty close to what CCR did. The majority of the album was given to its least talented members, and the result was 1972's Mardi Gras, a completely predictable disaster. Rolling Stone called it the worst album they'd ever heard from a major band. CCR itself would only last a few more months before breaking up. But was it really that bad? Let's find out. This is Train Records. Okay, I want to be clear. The drummer did not write all the songs on CCR's last album. The plan was to have all the band members do an equal share of the work, so it's not as bad as the Ringo analogy I said earlier. But in a way, it's also much worse than the Ringo idea, because people liked Ringo. Ringo had a personality. People knew who he was. People didn't have a clue who the other guys in the band were. They barely knew the main guy in the band. Like, what's his name? I got a young viewership, so a giant chunk of you don't even know. And before those of you who do know jump down the youngins' throats, let me ask you, who are the other guys in the band? Who's this guy? What instrument does he play? 95% of you failed that question, probably more. Like, I'm a classic rock guy myself, and I knew so little about them, I had to go, like, buy books and read them and shit. Ugh. But here's what you need to know. Before 1971, Creedence had one singer and one songwriter. That's John Fogarty. He wrote and sang all the songs, and he also played lead guitar, did most of his own backup singing, he produced, he was their business manager, he controlled literally everything. The other three are John's brother Tom on rhythm guitar, Stu Cook on bass, and Doug Clifford on drums. And unless you were a super fan, you wouldn't know any of those three guys. Like, one of the odd things about Creedence was that they were the biggest rock band in America, but they weren't rock stars. They wore flannel shirts and kept out of the news. Reporters would show up to interview him and not even know which one was John Fogarty. And if the lead singer's not getting attention, you can imagine how little the fucking bass player gets. One of them said to me, should I get his or not? Is he just here to see them or is he one of them? <laughs> so, I guess the rest of the band started getting butthurt about it and that's where the trouble starts. I can't tell you exactly what happened next. The details are hazy because the band members all hated each other and still do to this day, so there's a real Rashomon thing going on. I've done a few reviews of bands in meltdown mode, but those at least seemed like an honest clash of personalities. In this case, one of the two sides is absolutely lying. Or maybe they're both lying, but they're not both telling the truth. But here's my closest understanding of what went down. At some point in 1970, the other three guys called together a big group meeting where Tom and Doug and Stu met with Fogarty and demanded more power and more creative control, more contributions. You know, I want to sing, I want to write songs, I want to play more or something. My, my thing should be louder on the record. 
John Fogarty calls it the Knight of the Generals. He means that all the soldiers in their little unit wanted to be in charge. It's also a reference to a movie about Nazi generals at the end of the war when everything's falling apart, so... Uh, yeah, that should tell you what John thought of the rest of the band. They had to hear John give up the reins. We will now be a democracy. Four guys, four votes. A short time later, Tom quit the band anyway, so now there were just three. Sometime after that, John Fogarty came up with the idea to split the work equally. Write your own songs, sing them, even produce them yourselves. Here's what Doug and Stu say John told them at the time. Guys, I'm burnt as hell. I'm tired. You're gonna have to step in and help me out. Here's how they describe it now. Fine! You want more input? Why don't you write the songs? And here's how Fogarty describes them. Wah! Wah! I wanna write songs! Wah! I don't know what the real story is. Fogarty says he was trying to make everyone happy. Doug and Stu say it was an ultimatum. He told each of us to write it, to sing a third of the album or he was going to quit. Whatever they originally demanded, I get the feeling Doug and Stu did not think they'd be expected to carry such a heavy load so quickly. But also that they convinced themselves that it was doable. I mean, they're on all those songs too. They're part of the band. They're just as good. It's going to work out. They went into the studio in 1971 to pump out yet another hit. As they did. CCR was a damn hit factory. No reason to stop now. And Fogarty wrote them their next single. That single is Sweet Hitchhiker. Oh yeah, this one's a barn burner. It's a song about finding some hot mama hitchhiking on the side of the road and uh... Yeah, it's got some power behind it. CCR were a laid-back band, but when they wanted, they could absolutely tear it up. And that's what they're doing here. Yeah, yeah, they're killing it. Yeah, this song is crap. I actually had a really strong negative reaction to this. I did not like this at all. I don't want to hear CCR sing about chicks, man. Credence was a soulful band about serious things, about hard living and tough times, growing up at the bottom, life on the road. They didn't write meathead songs about girls. And I know what you're thinking. What about Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress? That song's pretty good, right? <sighs> yeah, well, that's not actually them. That's the Hollies. In the early 70s, Credence wasn't even the best version of Credence anymore. But I digress. But uh, yeah, this is bad. What it mostly reminds me of is that there were a lot of guys that became hippies who weren't actually rebelling against anything, they just wanted grass and ass. So here we got this dude bro fantasy about picking up some random hot chick and she sucks your dick. The unwritten book of the road. Yeah, like that. Ish. It just doesn't sound Credence. It sounds like all the shitty boogie blues butt rock that came after them. Where the hell did this come from? Well, I'll tell you this. It made more sense when I found out that Fogarty was going through a divorce at the time. You know, he's been a married man a long time. Now he's famous and he's a free man. Probably feeling himself. Single, ready to mingle, ready to score some action. Yeah, he was only 26 at the time, but if you imagine him in a bar in a middle-aged sport coat and a balding ponytail, the song makes a lot more sense. For the record, Fogarty does not get his dick sucked in the song. He's so busy drooling, he crashes into a ditch and the hot chick blows by him laughing. So, you know, see, it's, it's funny. It's okay. I guess. I don't know. I can't make out a word he's singing anyway. But the test of time says I'm right. Fogarty doesn't perform it anymore and no one ever plays it. Fogarty barely even mentions it in his book. Eh, whatever, it's not that bad. That bridge is pretty awesome. The band was still hot shit, so they went right into the top ten again. But whatever, the, the true test of this experiment was not going to be Fogarty's songs. Let's check out the B-side, the first Creedence song not written by John. Stu the bassist wrote this one. It's called Door to Door. Well, 
Well, this sounds like ass. And Stu can't sing at all. At least I don't think he can. I can't tell behind all that reverb. Lyrically, it's about being a door-to-door -door salesman. I guess that's not too different from life on a riverboat. So, uh, yeah, it's just like Proud Mary. If Proud Mary was a joke song by a guy who can't sing. In my latest sample, I can show you how to use it. Where's your pull up curtain while I spread some hair? Stuff will get the stain out of it. You use the loose they want it. This year will take the pain out and we'll mess your hair. I think this was supposed to be innuendo and then he just forgot what he was doing. I, okay, I have to believe that Doug and Stu are telling the truth. They didn't want this. They never demanded it. Because if they demanded to write songs and all they had was a novelty about selling stain remover, I, it rhymes door with door. In any case, the full album came out in 1972. And that alone was a big tell that this didn't go well because that was two years since their last album. CCR usually pumped out records every six months. I mean, every three months there was a Creedence single. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was too professional, so we decided yeah. to wait 12 months. But, you know, they're trying out some new shit. Maybe that's to be expected. It was called Mardi Gras. Because it's a party album. You know, Mardi Gras. Woo! Well, let's listen to the album proper. Let's kick this shit off. I mean, Creedence albums always start with a bang. Green River. Ramble Tamble. Down on the Corner. Born on the Bayou. Always leading off strong, those albums. And here's the opener John wrote for this one. Looking for a reason. I'm a looking for a reason today. I'm all wound up and tied in knots today. I'm a looking for a reason. So, uh, it's, uh, it's a country song. Interesting way to start. I guess Creedence was never far from country, but they were still always a rock band. They had muscle, and this is just kind of sickly and sad. But I do notice that, um, yeah, this is extremely about the band breaking up. I used to like it, yeah. I can't remember why. Yeah, that's... Yeah, it's not hard to figure out what's going on here. Hey, true story, but their last big hit before this album, Have You Ever Seen The Rain? That was also about them breaking up. Have you ever seen the rain Coming down the day? See, the sunny day is all their success, and the rain is the band dysfunction that was tearing them apart. But I'd have never guessed. I mean, it's poetic, it's universal. But I listen to this, and, uh, yeah, no song has ever been about just one thing more than this one. Because I Got High is more open to interpretation than this. Cause I got high, because I got high, because I got high. Maybe it's about being high on life. Anyway, second song. Another one from Stu. Take It Like a Friend. Maybe you move over, get someone else to change. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Big ol' nope. Thought you had the honor. Oh my god. I thought he was bad on the last one, but I had no idea. Now I know why he needed all that reverb. In fact, can we slap some reverb on this one too? That's way better. Jesus Christ. <laughs> no, hold on. Play it normally. Maybe you move over. Yeah, Stu is just shit talking John right to his face. Seems so long when we begin. Hope you take it like a friend. And surprise, John did not take it like a friend. He refused to help at all. He barely even played guitar on any of the other guys' songs. Kind of a dick move, but I wouldn't want to help write a song about what an asshole I am either. And how can Stu claim now that John forced them to write songs when he's clearly complaining that John should let them write songs? Playing a pavilion on the outskirts 
town. Doug the drummer has two songs after that. They're fine. They're okay. They're not with a song. They're not with a song. Actually, they're probably less than mediocre, but having heard Stu's songs, I'm inclined to be generous. I paid no attention. Left them books at home. Without playing my music real loud. Doug obviously still isn't as good a singer as John. John could fucking holler. Doug is just soft. He sounds like your grandpa. But at least he's better than Stu. Lock the door. By the way, Stu's third song in here is called Sail Away. It's about being a sailor. Mostly so he can shit talk the captain. The captain of the sea. Shout the to his crew. Guess who that is? Who could he be talking about? Fitting that this is about sailors, because Stu is incredibly salty. An album about your own band chaos seems like it should be more entertainingly messy, but only Fleetwood Mac could pull that off because they had three songwriters. CCR had one. Oh, and there's a cover song on here. Great, a cover. Now no one has to write anything. And CCR were a great covers band. Some of their biggest hits were covers. Suzy Q, Midnight Special. This one's a cover of Ricky Nelson's Hello, Mary Lou. Hello, Mary Lou. Okay, play play them back to back. Hello, Mary Lou. Goodbye, heart. We made it on so loving you. I knew Mary Lou. We never part. So hello. It's the same fucking song. They've added nothing. There is one bright spot. At the end of side A, there is one great goddamn song. Someday never comes. First thing I remember was asking Papa why. Oh, they... It is so much better than the rest of the album, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, this one is about John's parents' divorce and John's useless deadbeat dad. Considering that he was going through his own divorce, you can see why it was on his mind. He ended up not getting divorced for the record. He stayed with his wife another 10-15 years. And I think his own song convinced him. It's the standout track on the album by far. good stuff. Although honestly I would have maybe given it one more pass through before recording it. it. does feel like maybe it's a little too fast or the chorus should be louder. It reminds me a lot of Tuesday's Gone by Leonard Skinner which came out the year after and which I prefer honestly. It soars a lot higher. I did wonder if that was just me being the nasty critic. You know gotta find something to complain about but for what it's worth Fogarty says the same thing. He also wishes he'd spent a little more time on it but he hated the other guy so much at that point he just wanted to get it done. And just wanting to get it done is the entire impression I get from this album. It took him four times as long as usual to get done, and it still only clocks in at under half an hour. I've had sandwiches that took me longer to finish than this record. By the 70s, bands are trying to give you your full money's worth on an LP. 28 minutes is a length that says that they just wanted to shit something out and call it a day. And one of the things that Credence's critics used to give him shit for is being a singles band instead of an album band. You know, oh, they just exist to get radio hits. They're basically Maroon 5. And people had that idea because Credence made albums the same way that Elvis or Chuck Berry would have in the 50s. You know, you record the singles, you let them become hits, and then you slap them on an LP. And then you fill out the rest with cover songs and a handful of deep cuts. They weren't trying to make Sgt. Peppers, is what I'm saying. But that criticism only came from the real snobs. They were clearly wrong. Those albums are extremely cohesive. They're not just a collection of songs. But Mardi Gras absolutely is just a bunch of songs, slapped together in random order. I mean, it ends with Sweet Hitchhiker. That's not a closer, that's an opener. No one seems to have any interest or care in making this a real album. But believe it or not, a lot of critics liked it. Plenty of big publications gave it decent reviews. Rolling Stone was the only one that really went in hard on it. But Rolling Stone turned out to be absolutely right. This album blows. Doug and Stu say that John expected them to run before they could crawl and hung him out to dry like he was trying to embarrass them. 
Rolling Stone called it Fogarty's Revenge. Fogarty says he wasn't trying to hurt anyone. I don't believe him at all. In any case, he sure wasn't trying to make it work. I've listened to this album a bunch of times now and I still can't remember Doug's songs and I remember Stu's songs for all the wrong reasons. It's a death rattle from a group of very unhappy people working against each other rather than together. Everyone in it comes off like an asshole. Doug and Stu say Fogarty is a tyrant. Fogarty says there are a couple of talentless ingrates. I don't know who's right. But you know what? Springsteen never has drama with his band because he is the boss. That's his name. Everyone knows who makes the decisions. CCR should have just named themselves John Fogarty and the Credences, and it would have been clear who was in charge, and none of this would have happened. Credence never reunited except for Tom's wedding and their high school reunion. The hostility never subsided, and in fact, they are all still suing each other right now. What a waste. What a stupid idea this album was. Hey, I've got an idea. Why don't I make my dog write my reviews from now on? You're not pulling your weight, dog. Why do I have to do all the work? Give me a thousand words on the new Eminem album. This is what you wanted, right? I heard you begging at me. That was clearly what you meant. 